Hi there, boys and girls. Welcome to today's vodcast on the structures and functions of the flower. So first thing we have to know is that the flower is a reproductive structure of an angiosperm. And there's two main sections of a flower. And a flower could be one of three things. It could be a male flower, it could be a female flower, or it can be a flower that contains both male and female structures. So let's review what those male and female structures are. The first part that we're going to talk about is the male structure, and that's called the stamen. The stamen is easy to remember that it's male because the word is spelt with M-E-N at the end. So it actually spells out the word men. So if you can remember that men are males, then you'll remember that stamen is the male part. Now as the male part of the flower, the stamen's main job is to produce grains of pollen. And pollen are structures that contain the sperm cells for the flower. So the goal is to get the sperm of this flower into the eggs of another flower or maybe even the same flower that the sperm was made on. So to take a closer look at what pollen looks like, we'll take a peek at this picture here. Now this is a picture of a bee that's obviously been hunting for nectar or food out in flowers and been walking around in them. And as you can see, there's a bunch of yellow spheres located all over the bee, stuck in its fur and so forth. This is pollen. This is what pollen looks like up close. So those are the pollen structures of a flower. Now the pollen of a flower is produced by a structure called the anther. And the anther is this structure here at the top of this thin stalk. And this thin stalk is called the filament. And the filament's main job is to support the anther, to hold it up. This way the wind or different agents of pollination like butterflies and bees can bump into the anther and get pollen all over themselves. So pollen can easily be dispersed. So the anther and the filament make up the male structures of the flower, which is called the stamen. Now when the pollen is being transferred, it's going to end up on the female parts of the flower. And the female parts of the flower is called the pistil. And the pistil includes the following structures. We have the stigma, the style, the ovary, and then inside the ovaries we have our ovules. So we'll start at the top of the stigma. The main structure of the stigma is to collect the pollen. So when the pollen is brushed up against it by a pollinator, or through the wind, the pollen grains are going to stick on the stigma, and then the pollen grains will release the sperm cells on the stigma there. And we'll take a closer look on how that happens later. Now, the sperm cells released from the pollen on the stigma now move down this long, slender tube going deep inside the flower, and this part of the flower is called the style. The style is the tube that connects the stigma to the ovary. And then when we get down to the bottom of the style, we have this rounded structure called the ovary, and the ovary's main function is to contain and protect the ovules. Now you might be wondering, well, what's so great about the ovules? Why do they need protection? Well, don't forget, the ovules are the female parts of the flower, so the ovules are going to house the eggs that are needed for fertilization. So those are the different parts of the flower. Let's take a look at what, now let's take a look at what the process of pollination looks like. Okay, so here we have a picture of our flower and the parts are labeled again. And then we have a close-up image of the pistil on the right here. Before we discuss the process of pollination, what I'd like to discuss is the difference between two kinds of pollination that a flower can carry out. The first kind of pollination I like to talk about is cross-pollination. Now, cross-pollination is simply when a flower is fertilized by another flower. So this means a bee covered in pollen from one flower travels to another flower, and as it's rooting through the flower to find some food, the pollen from the original flower that's on the bee will get brushed off onto the pistil and then that sperm will fertilize the eggs there. Now we can also have self-pollination which is exactly what it sounds like. During self-pollination a flower fertilizes itself. So if the wind is blowing and some of the pollen gets knocked off the anthers it's possible that they can stick onto their own stigma and fertilize the eggs in the same plant that the sperm was made in. So those are the two types of pollination that we have. Now what basically happens during pollination is if you take a look at the anther here and the pollen grains, the pollens are dispersed or knocked off or transported from the anther to the stigma. And as we said here at the top, the stigma is collecting and holding onto the pollen. Now if we take a look at the right here, the close-up image of the pistil, we'll notice that the pollen on the stigma releases the sperm and then starts to create a pollen tube all the way down into the ovary. Now once the sperm gets into the ovary, it's going to go into the ovules and fertilize the ovules. Once the ovules are fertilized, the ovary will eventually become a fruit, and then the ovules will then turn into seeds. So by definition, 
Any fruit that you eat has to have seeds in it. So an apple is a fruit, an orange is a fruit, a banana is a fruit, a tomato is a fruit, a cucumber is a fruit, and a pepper is a fruit. Now most of us have grown up being taught that tomatoes, cucumbers, and peppers were vegetables. The difference between a fruit and a vegetable is that fruits have seeds, vegetables do not. So tomatoes, cucumbers, and peppers do have seeds in them which makes them a fruit and they were fertilized from a flower. Now what a vegetable is, is an edible part of a plant. So we talked about carrots yesterday. Carrots, remember, are the taproot of that plant. So since we can eat the carrot, it's a vegetable. When you eat celery, you are eating the stem of a plant. So the celery is a vegetable. And then when you eat lettuce, you're eating the leaves of a plant. So that's the main difference between a vegetable and a fruit. Now let's take a look at the fertilization process of the flower and how it does turn into a fruit. Mature plants produce flowers, which contain a structure called a style that has a stigma at the top and an ovary at the bottom. Within the ovary, the flower has several ovules that contain egg cells. When a grain of pollen lands on the stigma, it extends a sperm tube down the style into the ovary. The sperm tube attaches to an ovule Sperm cells from the pollen travel down the sperm tube and fertilize the egg cell. Once each ovule within the ovary contains a fertilized egg cell, the flower's petals wither and fall away. The ovary has become a fruit, and each of the ovules has become a seed. If it lands in the proper environment, each of the seeds can grow into a new plant. So, okay, boys and girls, that's how flowers become pollinated and how the pollination of a flower can turn the ovary of a flower into a fruit. Now, let's take a look at the structures of seeds for these flowering plants, which are super important because that's how new plants are made. Flowering plants have been pretty successful throughout the course of evolution because the fruits offer more protection and it helps them disperse the seeds a little better. You and I, we would eat a fruit, and after we've eaten everything, we usually leave the core with the seeds in them and we'll throw them out or if we're eating an orange or something like that we'll typically spit the seeds out onto the ground so even in that manner you're helping disperse these seeds to grow into new plants other animals they'll typically eat the entire fruit core and seeds and all things that you and I would normally throw out and since seeds are undigestible they'll pass through the digestive system of these organisms and then re-enter the world through the uh, fecal matter of the animal so because flowering plants have been so successful, there are actually two groups of flowering plants, and we're going to talk about them. We're going to discuss monocots and dicots and their seed characteristics. Let's take a look at monocot and dicot seeds and the structure and functions of these seeds. So first off, I would just want to concentrate on the middle section here labeled seed structure. So this is what a typical seed looks like to you and I that we normally think about when we look at and think about seeds. However, you can see that monocots here on the left have a much different look than dicots here on the right. But they do have the same structures in them. There are three main structures to a seed. First of all, there's what's called a seed coat. The seed coat is a protection for the embryo inside of the seed. As we talked about earlier in the year, is the baby form of an organism, so the embryo is the baby plant that's inside of the seed. And then lastly, we have a very, very important structure called the cotyledon. The cotyledon is the stored food in the seed. The monocots and the dicots are the two types of angiosperm seeds, and even though they do look different, they do have the same structures. So, for example, we have the embryos in the seeds, so those are the baby plants. We have the seed coat for the seeds to offer the protection as we said and then lastly we have the cotyledons of the seeds now the main difference between a monocot and a dicot is actually the number of cotyledons that they have if you take a look at the word monocot and you break it down into the words mono and cot mono means single or one and cot is short for cotyledon so monocots have one cotyledon Whereas if we take a look at dicots, di means two, and cots is cotyledon, dicots actually have two cotyledons, here and here, as opposed to the one cotyledon here. So an example that you're familiar with, especially with summer rolling around, of a monocot that you might eat for with dinner is corn. Corn is a monocot. However, you could also eat things like baked beans or green beans, 
and green beans are dicots because they do have two cotyledons. Now again, these are seeds that you are eating. So the main purpose of the seed is to germinate and turn into a new plant. So let's take a look at the different types of conditions that these seeds need and what the word germinates means. All right, so here we have the germination of two types of seeds. We have our monocot here on the left and our dicot here on the right. But before we talk about that, what you need to know is that the word germination is the development of a plant from a seed. So as a seed sprouts and grows into a plant, that is when the seed starts to germinate. In order to get a seed to successfully germinate, you need three conditions that need to be right to get the seed to go. So first of all, you need a specific type of gas. Now we talked about how plants need carbon dioxide for photosynthesis. Our seeds aren't photosynthesizing, so they actually need oxygen because the development of this plant is going to require a lot of energy. So as a result, they're going to need oxygen to make that energy. So soil is usually loosely packed and has a lot of air pockets in it, so there's plenty of oxygen that can get in. Next, you need water. Obviously, water is needed for all plants, so this way they can carry out all the chemical reactions that they need. However, we do need one more condition, and a lot of kids think it's sunlight. And I'm going to tell you right now, it's not the sunlight. The sun does play a part of it, but it's not sunlight. And the reason being is this. If you take a look at the seeds here, first of all, do they have any leaves on the outside? No, they don't. The embryos have the leaves, which are on the inside of the seed. Second of all, where do you put the seeds usually? You usually plant the seeds in the soil. So if you plant the seeds in the soil, the sunlight is not going to get to the seeds because it's going to be blocked by the soil. So sunlight is not what's required. However, you do need warmth. So in order to get seeds to germinate, you need to have these three conditions. All right, boys and girls, well, that concludes today's vodcast on flowers, the reproductive parts of the flowers, and the parts of the seeds and seed germination. Thank you for your time.